It's clobbering time, folks. Today on Hashtag Ask You Sam for June 27, 2016, I'm Graham Giusin Matthews. Only one week removed from last week's Money the Bank pay-per-view, an awesome edition of Hashtag Ask You Sam. Once again, a big thanks goes out to Jason Davis, Blue Eye Disorder, right here on the YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. Check out his video that we did on his channel last Monday. Awesome time hanging out with him. Hopefully it's not long before we get to hang out again. Film another one of these videos for you guys. Came out great. So I look forward to talking to him again in the future right here on Hashtag Ask You Sim. But in the meantime, and in between time though, as you can probably notice from my entrance music today, This Fire Burns by Kill Switch Engage. My awesome t-shirt that I got from Pro Wrestling Tees a few years ago. Fucking love this t-shirt. It's the five year anniversary of the Pipe Bomb promo, guys. Um, I have not seen nearly enough love for the promo as they probably thought I would on Twitter this morning. I know WWE 2K Games uh, released the cover for the new video game with Brock Lesnar. That's awesome. But I was expecting more tweets. I guess not. Maybe I'm the sole CM Punk fan left. I don't know. He is fighting on September 10th. That was revealed this past week. Uh, making his UFC debut inside the Octagon. Uh, I think it's September 10th against Mickey Gale. Gale Mickey, whatever the hell his name is. Uh, so that fight's coming up. I can't wait. You know, I can't wait for that. Should be exciting. But like I said, five years since the famous pipe bomb promo. And the thing about this promo is this. And I talk about this every single year on Facebook, Twitter. I did a whole video blog about it a few years ago, right? You're on the channel. If you want to go back and check it out, you know, type in uh, on the channel. Just type in pipe bomb promo, analyzing the impact of the pipe bomb promo. Three years later, I filmed it back in 2014. But I always watch that promo back on the anniversary of it every single year on June 27th. Today is also marking the anniversary of John Cena's WWE debut from 14 years ago. So congrats to him. But also as well, it just blows my mind that it's been that long. I, vi I mean, I remember everything anyway for the most part. Like I remember what I did on this day, you know, six, seven years ago, last year, whatever. But I specifically very, very clearly remember, like it was yesterday, sitting on my couch in not this house, but my old house where I used to live. With my two brothers, neither of whom, one of them used to be a wrestling fan, the other one has never been a wrestling fan. But we were watching Raw, maybe they had nothing else better to do, so they were watching Raw with me. And after they saw that promo, they knew just as well as I did, that was something iconic. That was an iconic moment in wrestling history. I called up John, freaking the hell out, like, did you just see what I just saw? It was absolutely amazing. So, in honor of five years since the Pipe Bomb promo, before we go forward here, I did film myself reenacting the promo. If it's not already up here in the channel, by the time this video goes up, it should be up a short time later. <clears throat> so, be sure to check it out. I do film it. I, I don't remember every single word. I don't memorize every word, so I read off the script. It's very noticeable, but I thought it'd be fun, so I did reenact the... Uh, the infamous Pipe Bomb promo from five years ago today. Be sure to check it out right here in the channel coming up pretty shortly. And, uh, yeah, so I, I can't wait to rewatch the promo back in a little while right after I'm done with this video. But hashtag Ask You Sam here today. Without further ado, if you guys want to send in questions, be sure to tweet me right on the Twitter right here or on YouTube, but on Twitter as well, at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask You Sam. On the Facebook page, down in the links below, facebook.com backslash graham.jusen.matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself. Or just leave a comment on this very video. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So without further ado, guys, let's go forward here with this week's question. For the first time ever, though, we do have a question. He did not technically text it to me. He said he what he forgot. Um, but he did say it to me in person. So for the first time ever, via text, via word of mouth, from Jason D, Jason One Punch Davis, Jason Blue Eye Disorder on the YouTube Davis, who joined me last week here on the show. His question was... Uh, Big, uh, a two-punch question, a two-prong question, very good question. First one being, my favorite designs of the WWE Intercontinental and the World Tag Team titles. And I'll get to the second part of the question in a second. So, for my favorite designs of each title, for I'll start with the World Tag Team. I really liked, and I know Jason said when we talked about this over the weekend, he loved the 90s version of the World Tag Team titles. I do like those Tag Team titles, too. My favorite version Hate the idea, I hate the design that we have now that, that look like fucking pennies. I just do not like that design at all. I liked the Red World Tag Team titles that we had before they were retired back in 2010. That were used primarily for the Raw brand for many years. So I love those Tag Team titles. Those were my favorite World Tag Team Championship designs. Uh, for Intercontinental Championship, as you could probably guess, I love the current design. The classic, whatever the hell you want to call it. I mean, we've had it for five years by this point. Obviously, we had many, we had it for many years prior to that, but um, the other design, I didn't hate the other design for the Intercontinental Championship that we had for a good 10, 15 years. I didn't hate that design. I just love this one a lot better. Even the, I'll give a shout out to the Ultimate Warrior design, the same belt, obviously, just with a yellow strap instead of the white. I prefer the white, but the yellow was cool for Ultimate Warrior. 
So obviously that's my favorite IC Championship title design. And for the WWE Championship, that's a really tough one. There's a lot of good ones. I hated the spinner belt, so that was not my favorite. I honestly don't mind the new one. I remember when the new one debuted. It's basically the same thing with the same logo on the front. It just looked like it was bedazzled or something. And I love the idea that people get their logos on the belt instead of their name. I know wrestlers work their entire careers to get their name on a championship belt, but I love the idea that they have their logos on there too, so that's pretty cool. I don't hate the current belt. I actually really like it. I don't know if it's my favorite though. Love the Stone Cold title, the Rocks title, the Brahma Bull title. Probably Winged Eagle, I want to say. I like the NSP the Championship too. Probably Winged Eagle. I feel like it just comes across as like, that's a fucking world championship right there. As opposed to, maybe not so much the current one, but the spinner belt came across like a toy. And it was tailor-made for John Cena. Beyond John Cena holding it, it was a complete waste of a championship. So, I love the Winged Eagle. That's probably my favorite WWE title design I see in World Tag Team title, I already said. Uh, his second question, would I bring back the Cruiserweight or European Championships? European, it has to be under, you know, good circumstances. It has to be under the right circumstances. I've talked about this before. For the European title, no. As an extra title, I would not. But if you reincarnated the U.S. Championship as the European title, I would do that. Because Rusev's the current U.S. Champion right now anyway. So why wouldn't you just have him make it into the European Championship? You know what I mean? I feel like that makes the most sense. And then there was talk of doing that when Cesaro was champion many years ago, when Rusev was champion the first time around. He even teased it. I feel like he, I, I believe he tweeted out a picture of the European Championship with like the new WWE logo on it. I have no idea what the hell that was about because we never saw it surface on WWE TV. Maybe it was an idea that got scrapped. I'm not exactly sure. But I would love to see it brought back with Rusev at, and not as just in like an extra title. Like when we had 10 different active championships in WWE at one point, even before the brand split many years ago, it was a complete waste because those championships meant basically nothing. I mean, they were cool belts, but they meant nothing. So unless Rusev brings back or, re, you know, like I said, reincarnates the U.S. championship as the European title, then probably not. The Cruiserweight Championship's a good one. I heard in watching the weigh-ins and the, and the intro videos, which you should definitely check out, by the way, for the Cruiserweight Classic um, that took place last week. They taped it last week. It won't air until July 13th, but commentators Mar Ronaldo and Daniel Bryan, which is a dream team, by the way, they mentioned that the winner will be getting a trophy, not a championship, which is what I expected a lot like with the, the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic last year. They got an awesome-looking trophy, not a fucking, like, a championship or anything like that, which is completely understandable. But I would not be surprised if the show paved the way for the return of the Cruiserweight division. Like, I expect many people from this show to be signed to WWE, uh, to be brought back like a Tajiri or to be re -signed, or to be signed to new contracts like a Zack Zaber Jr. or a Kota Ibushi, which I know, I guess he's kind of hesitant about coming in right now, but he could very well be signed, who knows? So I could definitely see those guys coming in for a new Cruiserweight Championship show, which would be pretty cool, beyond the Cruiserweight Classic. Um, so I could definitely see that being a possibility. I don't know. I mean, it would have to be done right. I always say this all the time, but if you bring it back as a part of SmackDown, maybe it could work. It's got to be done right, like I said. You can't bring in fucking, like, super porky and, like, shit talent that no one gives a shit about, which is why the light heavyweight division failed in WWE so many years ago because WWE was trying to capitalize off the momentum and mainstream attention and popularity that the WCW had going with um, cruise, with, with their Cruiserweight division. So it's got to be done right. But I feel like all the talent they have in this new Cruiserweight Classic show is absolutely amazing. And a lot like with Tough Enough, with, pff, God knows, um, maybe like over half those people. Like not the 2011 season, which boggled my mind. They signed none of those people except for Cameron. But the latest season, although the show was not that great, they signed over half the people. Patrick Clark, Mata, Daria, Amanda, Zizi, Josh... Maybe somebody else. That's like six, five to six people right there. That's over half the cast. And then another two, Chelsea and Gabby, are in TNA right now. So it's not completely out of the ordinary, despite the fact that if they lose this Cruiserweight Championship show, they could be brought back as Cruiserweights for a new potential division, which I'd be totally on board for, if done right, like I said. Captain Sunshine, starting with our YouTube questions here. Uh, they're saying, I, for one, am happy with Dean Ambrose as champion, mostly because he's easier to talk about right now than Roman Reigns or Seth Rollins. Reigns and Rollins are two sides of a weird, frustrating coin where people hate Reigns for reasons that have devolved into hate for the sake of it, and people want to love Rollins, despite WWE strange reasons for trying to keep him a despicable coward heel, despite producing the special themselves that showed him how much of a hardworking, passionate athlete he is. I guess what I'm trying to get at is this. Is Ambrose the only one out of the Shield who has a straightforward relationship with the crowd? Right now, yes. 
I mean, like you said, Rollins is bound to be a babyface. Why he isn't already blows my mind. It's not like they're waiting for a, a, the perfect moment, because their perfect moment would have been when he came back at Money in the Bank, and they failed both times to do it. Roman Reigns is the worst out of the three. Now, I'm not talking about skill-wise, even though probably that way, too, he's probably the worst, but I'm talking about, like you said, crowd relationship. People just hate Roman Reigns, despite their WWE stubbornness to push him as a babyface. Rollins, they're trying to make him a heel for some reason, despite the fact he was kind of portrayed in a babyface light and money in the bank. Like you said, very strange, very frustrating at times. Dean Ambrose is pretty straightforward. I mean, he's not a perfect character. He kind of gets too cute with his comedy at times, which I've talked about before here on WrestleRant Radio, many other places before. But other than that, I mean, he's a beloved babyface. He's a scrappy, resilient, underdog-like character that has been getting over with the audience despite coming up short time and time again over the years. I wrote a whole Facebook post about this on Friday if you want to check it out, about how Dean Ambrose is like the, other than Sami Zayn, like WWE's ultimate underdog right now. He's fallen short in many big time marquee matches when, you know, in those big fight feel matches against Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins, time and time again, Triple H, where he's come up short, yet still the audience rallies behind him. And he got a huge reaction when he won the championship, obviously, at Money in the Bank. I mean, there were some detractors online and whatever, but other than that, by and large, the reaction to Ambrose winning the championship was huge, very positive. So you're absolutely right. Out of those three guys right now, he definitely has the most straightforward relationship with the audience. That might change in due time if they make him a tweener, which I hope they don't. Uh, Maybe if they turn him heel, I'd be completely fine with that at some point, but... For right now, just keep him a straightforward baby face, especially in lieu of Rollins having this weird relationship, as you said, and Roman Reigns just not being there, period, <laughs> because of the suspension. Uh, Mitch G, also from YouTube, has got a couple questions here. Keep or erase Randy Orton's 2009 heel run or Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins' tag team championship reign? Easily keep the Orton heel run from 09 erase the Shield tag team title run. Not to say it wasn't great, because it was. The Shield had a lot of good matches with... Team Hell No, uh, the primetime players, the Usos, don't even get me started. The fucking Shield, they had a lot of great matches with. The Shield had, uh, not the Shield, I'm sorry, Cody, with themselves, yeah, with uh, Cody Rhodes and Goldust. They had a lot of awesome matches, but you're going to bring this up in your next question, which I'll talk about momentarily. It's not really remembered all that well. Like, it was a really good tag team title reign, but in the long term, in the long scheme of things, it didn't really make that much of a difference. The Shield was still on top, championship or no championship. They were still the most dominant thing going in WWE. They're still the best thing going in WWE at that time. Randy Orton's 09 Eel run, I think, like as you said, that was in the, in the over the course of the entire year of 09. The Shield run was only a few months, about five or six months. The Orton 09 Eel run was awesome. In my opinion, the best that Orton has ever been as a heel. Because in 09, he was vicious. I mean, the matches and feuds that he were having were not amazing. Like, the WrestleMania match with Triple H wasn't great. Um, the, the feud of Cena had been done a million times before. He'd already feuded with DX a million times before. So, the feuds and matches he had weren't really anything new, Batista too. But, character-wise, he was on fucking fire. I loved Randy Orton. I still love Randy Orton very much, like, as a character. But I felt like some of his best work as a heel was absolutely... Not even that I feel I know for a fact his best work as a heel was in 09. He kind of was getting started with it in 08, but as the Apex Predator, the Viper in 09, he was exactly that at his Apex. He was, you know, the character work with Triple H, the whole house brawl, the home, the whole home arrest thing, uh, the stuff with Batista and just breaking his leg and shit like that and looking like it broke, in our, not his leg, or his arm rather. It looked like he legitimately injured him in the middle of the ring. That, the stuff he did with Cena was really, really good. The legacy shit. That was awesome. As great as the Shield, uh, as great as the shield run was, nothing could top, in my opinion, that Orton heel run from 09. So gotta keep that, erase the Shield run. Uh, second question, am I missing something? Or does WWE never bring up the fact that Rollins and Reigns were tag team champions together? I can't remember the last time it was mentioned. It might have been mentioned here and there. I mean, they never really bring it up in their promos, but it is acknowledged in, like, video packages and stuff of The Shield when they've, you know, showed various video packages of The Shield over the past couple of weeks and building up this match, The Shield Triple Threat. They've shown videos and pictures of the two holding tag team titles together. So it's not completely ignored, but I do wish they would bring it up together because I feel like despite the fact that they were tag team champions together, the whole picture... It was more about the Shield on the whole than it was about Reigns and Rollins. You know what I mean? Like, it was more about the three of them being best friends as opposed to just Rollins and Reigns. Because although technically Reigns and Rollins were tag team champions officially together, 
Ambrose is kind of included there in my mind, not via the, the Freebird rule, which would have been cool, but because just because we had so many amazing six-man tag team matches that year that I kind of, everyone kind of throws them all together. It's not Ambrose and Reigns or Rollins and Ambrose or Reigns and Rollins. It's usually just all three. So, uh, yes, it is a bit weird that it's not, you know, uh, really acknowledged all that much or wasn't really brought up that, you know, that much during their the feud that they had going into Money in the Bank, but um, it's not too, too surprising just because of that fact I mentioned. Uh, his next question, have you ever heard been apathetic towards a match that the internet loved or vice versa? I'm sure there's been cases. I've been asked this match before. I've been asked this question before. Have there been matches that I hated that the internet loved or vice versa? I'm sure there's matches, but I just, I don't know, nothing really comes to mind because by and large, I feel like my opinion is along the same lines in, from the internet with the internet and when it comes to like math criticism. For the most part, I'm sure there's been matches that I love that the internet was just kind of like ant towards. But for the most part, I mean, I really can't, there's been so many matches, it's really hard to name just one or even think of one. So that's a hard question to ask. But I'm sure there's been cases where that has been the case. I just can't really think of them right now. And um, his fourth question, favorite road to WrestleMania from SmackDown versus Raw 2009 to WWE 12? Wow, good question. Um, I can't really remember the game modes. I played them all. I played all four, three games. Uh, I dominated those game modes. Those games were my life. Every single summer I would play those things. WWE 12, we talked about this. Uh, at E13A answer, I had talked about this, not last week with Jason, I think the week before. But the whole Triple H thing. That was a pretty cool game mode with like the whole League of Nations-like stable, the United Kingdom stable. Very unrealistic, but it was cool. Um, I feel like in 010, or the road to WrestleManias, you had, that was in 09 through 2011. 09, I think you had like the fucking Tony thing with John Cena. I don't know. All of those were pretty strange. So I'll probably go the WWE 12 one. I'll, I'll, you know, as out there as it was, it was pretty cool. So... I'll go the WWE 12 one because it was very different. You had to go, you got to play as your call, as Jacob Koss, as they called him. Um, I really enjoyed that one, so I'll go with that one. Uh, the first KFC, also from YouTube, should the Wyatt family take the titles from the New Day? In my opinion, would it be cool? Sure, just because the Wyatt family have never been champions before and they've been long overdue for a championship run, period. You know, let alone a tag team title run, a tag team title run of the Usos. You know, that they, that the, uh, that Harper and Rowan should have beaten the Usos for back in the summer of 2014. But in my opinion, they should hold out until SummerSlam to drop the belts to either um, Enzo and Cass in Brooklyn, which is the match I would do. And that's my money match at SummerSlam, considering it's in Brooklyn, Enzo and Cass's backyard. That's where the New Day won the championships to begin with a year ago. Them or the Bullet Club or the club, whatever. Uh, Anderson and Gallows. That'd be a really good match, a really good feud too. So, would I be pissed if they won the belts? No. Hopefully, the New Day just breaks the record. Period. Um, but beyond that, I feel like they should drop the belts to either Enzo and Cass or the club members, Gallows and Anderson, at SummerSlam. And his second question, thoughts on David Otunga replacing Jerry Lawler on commentary? Should he stay? He's actually not that bad. The thing is, and I think I was going to tweet this, but I forgot on Friday or something, Thursday, whenever I watched SmackDown, that he's actually really not really good, but I never the point of the Mac the, the, the fact I'm trying to make the, the point I'm trying to make here is that I was never a huge David Otunga fan. In fact, I just downright hated him as a wrestler. He just sucks as a wrestler, and I'm glad they're kind of relegating him to a commentary position for now anyway. Or I never really cared for the analyst stuff. I don't really watch the pre-show or anything like that. But David Otunga is a lot better in that role than he ever was as a wrestler. He's very well spoken, he's very professional, he's always been a very good talker. So, I'm fine with him on SmackDown for now, and, and, you know, while Jerry Lawler's out. Should he stay? If Lawler is ready to come back, or when he's ready to come back, and I feel like he could be back at some point, um, I would, you know, keep him on SmackDown. And, I've, you know, if you asked me a year ago, or even six months ago, I would have said hell no, but Jerry Lawler has been doing the best work of his commentary career in at least a decade. As a heel, him and Mauro Ronaldo are a really good combination, so I would take him, a heel Jerry, over a babyface David Otunga, or just David Otunga, period. But he's not bad. I'm completely fine with him on commentary for right now. I prefer Corey Graves or Tom Phillips on commentary instead of David Otunga, but he's a lot better than I thought he would be. So for now, I'm completely fine with him being the uh, the replacement for Jerry Lawler while he's out suspended. Emmanuel A's got a couple questions here. First one being, Battleground is looking pretty good right now. At least by what I presume is happening with Sasha Banks in the women's division. Saying and Owens, Styles and Cena, and the Shield triple threat. I don't know if I would call it the biggest or the best Battleground of all time, the way the WWE marketed Money in the Bank. In fact, I think they set expectations a little too high for that event 
where they were with the way they were declaring it. It reminded me of those Tony Schiavone calls in WCW about how X was the greatest moment in the history of our sport. Does this will be will this be the greatest X pay per view of all time? Statements ever irk you. When done, you know, all the time, yes, they are a bit irksome. They are a bit bothersome. They cannot overdo it. You know, I've never heard them say in the past, anyway, or for WrestleMania every single fucking year they do, the greatest WrestleMania of all time, and rarely is it the greatest WrestleMania of all time. It doesn't even come close to being the greatest WrestleMania of all time. But I get why they do that. It's marketing. But they never rarely, rarely did they ever say, this will be the greatest extreme rules of all time, the greatest money in the bank of all time, you know? They did that for that one show, I feel like, because of the dream match main events with Reigns and Rollins, Styles and Cena, the Money to Make Ladder match. That was justified. It led, I, I believe that it lived up to the hype and being an awesome show. Greatest of all time? Probably not, but it came close. Um, so do they kind of paint themselves into a corner with those statements? Absolutely. Do they bother me? When done, you know, when they're exaggerated and they're done all the time, like Tony Schiavone did in WCW, as you exactly just said. Yes, but I feel like WWE doesn't do that all the time. But they're pay-per-views anyway. Some matches in moment, they'll be like, oh, wow, that was the greatest match of all time. Like, no, it wasn't. It was a very good match, if not a great match, but it was not the greatest of all time. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if they're done, if they're overdone, if they're, you know, if they're just done all the time, if they say that all the time, specifically Michael Cole, it can be a bit irksome. But other than that, you know, every once in a while, when you do have a blockbuster card and you do want to tout it as one of the greatest installments of all time, I'm completely okay with that. It was just a five of the money in the bank. Just don't do that with every pay-per-view going forward. Like you said, with Battleground, I would not tout it as the greatest Battleground of all time because the last, we've only had three shows. You know, with Money in the Bank, we've at least had up to that point six installments before this year's. With Battleground, we've only had three. So to say it's the greatest of all time is like saying the sky is blue. You know what I mean? So hopefully that won't be the case. But um, I'm fine with it, you know, here and there, done sparingly. Uh, next question. Have you ever heard of the legend of Big Show's daddy? Basically, if you don't know, WCW kayfabe claimed that Big Show is the son of Andre the Giant, who died when Hulk Hogan body slammed him at WrestleMania 3. Of course, WWE has since erased that, though I've been watching the late 1999 Raws and found the storyline where Big Boss Man tricked Big Show into believing his father died of terminal cancer, only for Big Show's dad to die in re for real later on in WWF's timeline, which led to Boss Man further antagonizing Big Show by writing a poem and also crashing the funeral and stealing the casket. Have you ever heard of any of these storylines? Yes, I've heard of both. I mean, obviously, both are very famous. I mean, more so the Big Boss Man stuff. They replayed it all the time on... Uh, what was it? the Jerry Springer show, Too Hot for TV? They replayed it on the WWE list, on Countdown. I've seen it a million times. The Andre the Giant thing with Big Show, like you said, they kind of bury that now in that they don't really acknowledge it, but I am aware of what you're talking about. Um, which was also a stupid storyline to begin with, anyway, because you're comparing Big Show to Andre, and there really is no comparison there. Athletically, Big Show, I feel like, is better, but Andre's the bigger icon, the bigger attraction. Um, but anyway. I'm aware of both storylines. The Big Bossman thing was completely out of taste. But it was funny as hell, though. The casket thing was just completely out there, which was what made it so funny. Um, he did not actually die after the fact. Big uh, Big Show's father had actually died before that. Um, I believe he talked about in his documentary, which they you know, very much delve into in his documentary, which is also on the WWE Network, by the way. Big Show's dad had actually died many years earlier. So I guess he was okay with them bringing up the fact that he had died of terminal cancer on TV or something. That was years later. So Big Show's dad died before that angle was done, uh, not after the whole Big Boss Man thing. I just wanted to clear that up. His next question, I believe so anyway. That's what Big Show said in his documentary. Maybe I'm mixing something up, but I'm pretty sure from what I remember, he said that his Big Show, that Big Show's dad had actually died uh, many years before that angle was filmed. His next question Whenever anyone talks about Neville's character, I always think back to his NXT Championship feud to Sami Zayn, where he'd resort to devious tactics like pulling the ref out from counting a pin to take over Fatal 4-Way to keep the title and simply tell Sami he didn't have the killer instinct necessary to win the big one. Um, I always felt like that kind of character could be translated to the main roster, a wrestler who was willing to do an openly, openly anything to get their hands dirty to win their matches and avoid 50-50 feuds. Could Neville use this kind of character again for the main roster? Totally. I mean, everyone who did their characters in NXT was 10 times better. Like, Breeze could use the character that he had on NXT. Like, just basically the same character that all these guys have right now, with the exception of Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, whose characters have translated very well from NXT to the main roster. By and large, you just get the person from NXT on the main roster. 
and they don't really go into their backstory. Like, why should I care about this person? I care about him because I watch him in NXT, but what about the average Joe? What about the casual viewer that knows nothing about Tyler Breeze? Why should they give a shit? And that's why no one gives a shit about him because they were not given a reason to give a shit about him. You know what I mean? So with Neville, that'd be pretty cool. I mean, anything is better than what he was doing before, which was nothing. He was just kind of the flippity doo dah character. And I've said it before, he was basically like the newest Evan Bourne, who was amazing in the ring, was a really good wrestler, but he had no character. He just smiled all the time and people cheered for him because he did flippity doo dahs in the ring, not because he had a great you know, character, or he was likable. I mean, he was likable, but we had no reason to really care or invest about him beyond his moves in the ring. And that's when Neville became on the main roster before he got hurt. So, hopefully when he comes back, pretty soon anyway, they will do more with his character. I would love to see that kind of translate from NXT to the main roster. During that Sami Zayn feud, that kind of made him a Shades of Grey character. I mean, he got booed at Our Evolution, but he did not technically go heel, like, officially. You know what I mean? He was never like a full-fledged heel in that feud of Sami Zayn. They kind of teased it just because Sami was so freaking over. He was the heel by default, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, like I said, anything is better than what he was doing before, which was basically nothing. Because when he got called up to the main roster, again, he was just the guy who could do amazing flips. The guy who could do the red arrow. Not the guy who could... At least, like, Sami Zayn has an underdog story. Neville could have something similar, but anything is better than what he was doing before he got hurt, which was, like I said, nothing. Uh, his next question, is there a particular pay-per-view you ever thought got more criticism than it deserved? I don't know if it's my number one pick, but I remember enjoying the 2015 Money in the Bank show last year when I went to go see some reviews and opinions of the show. I noticed quite a bit of the backlash about nearly everything. The only match that seemingly gained general acclaim was Kevin Owens versus John Cena 2, and even then, the result of Cena winning prevented it from being the number one finish, uh, the one finish of that show that satisfied people. I didn't think the show was perfect. I mean, Sheamus won, Ambrose and Rollins went too long, but I didn't think the the uh, I didn't think I saw the all around frustration that it did. I didn't think I would see the all around frustration that I did. Um, are there any pay per views that I thought got more criticism than they deserved? Pretty much. I mean, there's a lot of shows out there that I you know I'm very much open. I'm a, I try to be as optimistic of a wrestling fan as I can be. So, by and large, I enjoy a lot of shows that WWE does. I mean, WrestleMania 32, I really enjoyed. People shit on it anyway. I didn't think it was a great show. I thought it was entertaining, but not a great show, if that makes sense. I very much differentiate the two. A very entertaining show is very different, in my opinion, from a great show. Just because it was entertaining at that time doesn't mean, like, long long term, it's going to be a great overall show. It had a lot of great moments, but not things that kind of set forward the future. You know, set the future in progress, in motion. So anyway, um, with Money in the Bank last year, I talked of this more in depth in my review of the show. Probably, I don't remember exactly, I talked about it so long ago, on a WrestleRant a few weeks ago, about how overall watching the show back, I was quickly quickly reminded how much I really liked that show. Um, that was a really, really good show. Like you said, Ambrose and Rollins, I thought was great. Cena and Owens was awesome, one of the best matches of that year. Arguably better than the Elimination Chamber match, which people, you know, I prefer that match over the Money in the Bank one, but still, both are awesome. And then the Money in the Bank ladder match itself wasn't great, but it was all right. And Sheamus winning, I didn't really hate at that time. The undercard wasn't bad either. I mean, the primetime players won the belts. And uh, Nikki and Paige had a pretty decent match with a bad finish, but I thought it was all right. The match itself, I thought was pretty good. So, um, for that particular pay-per-view, like you said, I feel like it got more criticism than it deserved. Some things are just better or worse in retrospect. I feel like one of those events is Money in the Bank of last year. I thought overall it was a really, really good show. Honestly, one of the better pay-per-views of 2015. And I remember it was you at E13A or Emmanuel um, that when we were doing the end of the year rewards or yeah, awards for next year wrestling, Money the Bank was on there. It was one of the shows of the year. It was not at all the show of the year for 2015 for WWE. But um, I thought, like you said, you thought the, the Money the Bank one would get more votes than it did just because I thought it was a very underrated show. I wholeheartedly agree that show should have gotten more praise than it did, in my opinion. Uh, next question from Mark S. Moving forward to the Facebook questions and now. Who should wrestling fans be looking out for in the Cruiserweight Tournament? Like I said earlier, Kota Ibushi. Cedric Alexander, I think, is awesome. He's great. He was great in Ring of Honor. He left and made it just in time for the Cruiserweight Classic. Hopefully, he gets signed. He is really, really good. He was honestly underutilized in ROH, so I hope he gets signed to a contract and... They do something with them in Ring of Honor. So Cedric Alexander, Kota Ibushi, speaks for himself. Uh, Brian Kendrick, I'm a big fan of. Tajiri, I'm looking forward to seeing back. 
Zack Sabre Jr., I've heard nothing but awesome things about. I've yet to watch any of his matches in full, but I know at JJF Tweets, Jared has, you know, he wrote a whole article about him for Next Day Wrestling a while ago. Um, so I kind of was first familiar with him back then, many months ago, the onset of 2016. So other than that, um, I mean, there's a lot of other great talent, but those are the names that stick out to Jerry, Brian Kendrick, the uh, Kodai Ibushi, Cedric Alexander, and Zack Sabre Jr. are the ones that I'm looking out for to see do really well. Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano, you're already probably familiar with from NXT. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this whole thing plays out. I'm looking forward to uh, the whole tournament on the whole. It looks really, really cool on paper. His next question I read that WWE are contacting a lot of past wrestlers trying to bring them back before the WWE draft. Who would you like to see return? Um, I mentioned this on Twitter. I'll probably write an article about it at some point. I mean, I've seen so many articles, then probably not. I feel like it's uh, a done-to-death topic at this point. And, I mean, this is only personal opinion. I'm not saying that this is the this is the uh, masses speaking here or I'm speaking for everybody. These are just kind of like guilty pleasure characters I would love to see back just for my own personal enjoyment, not because I feel like they would really add all that much to the roster. The Hardy Boys is an obvious one. They're currently under contract to Tina, so that's not happening anytime soon, maybe at some point. Uh, but MVP, Carlito, Mr. Kennedy would be cool, Shelton Benjamin. A lot of these guys, will they ever be world champion in WWE? Probably not, but it would be cool to see him back, you know, to put other talent over for a nice little nostalgia run. So, yeah, a few of those guys, John Morrison leads my list. I feel like he would be the one guy from the past they could actually fulfill his full potential to this time around. And I feel like he could be, honestly, like if they had two world championships again, he could be the world heavyweight champion on SmackDown. And I know people are thinking at the time, like, oh, in 2009, 2010, he should have been world champion. And he should have been. But I feel like the chances of him winning a championship now, as odd as this sounds, as strange as this sounds, he has a better chance of being a world champion in WWE in 2016 than he ever did in 2009 or 2010. And I say that because he has come so far on the mic, in the ring, as a character, everything. As an overall performer from six years ago, from five or six years ago when he initially left WWE, the guy has improved leaps and bounds in Lucha Underground. And he could really add a lot to WWE's main roster. So um, he's a guy I would love to see back. Like I said, Benjamin, Carlito, MVP, Kennedy, all those mid Carters from the 05, 06, 07 era. But any of those guys I would mark out to see back. Next question. Do you think Drew McIntyre was underutilized during his last run of WWE? And would you like to see him return for the WWE draft? Uh, was he underutilized? Yes, absolutely. I mean, was he boring You know, when he first started? Yes, but he did improve a lot, and they should have done a lot more with him than what they did, which was, again, nothing. Um, the 3MB shit, I hated. I thought that was just absolutely awful and a total waste of his talent. I mean, it was a platform for him to, you know, more of a platform for him to get over, but I feel like he should have broke away from them before they cut him, and it was a total waste, so uh, a real, real waste, but... uh He's a guy that I would love to see back. He's young enough where he could come back and really make an impact as a guy on, like, a top guy on SmackDown, maybe. And to answer the second part of your question, could we see him return for the WWE draft? No, just because he's the former TNA World WWE Champion. The TNA is trying to sign him to a new contract, but he's already under contract to them until maybe January, February, I think, something like that. So, obviously, that being said, he's currently in TNA. He's not coming back for the draft or anytime soon. But down the line, after proving himself as a real money player, as a real main event player in TNA, which is not saying a lot, but, you know, in TNA, he's really come into his own as a single star, the star that he should have been in WWE. So, yeah, I, I could see him back, at, the, at you know, at some point down the line, maybe, but anytime soon, definitely not, just because he's currently under contract to TNA. His next question, what do you think will happen with WWE main event and our WWE main event and superstars in terms of wrestling matches after the draft takes place? I don't know what will happen. My best guess would be to make them just brand exclusive, make superstars the Raw show like their version of Heat, and make main event SmackDown's version of Heat. I would do away with both shows anyway. I mean, sometimes we get a good match or two on main event. By and large, both shows are completely meaningless. Um, that said though, if they are going to keep them around, I imagine they probably will just because they have TV deals to fulfill over in, you know, fucking in England and Europe and shit. But, um, what I would do, I would just make superstars, the raw heat and then main event SmackDown's velocity, just because they tape main event on Tuesdays before SmackDown and superstars before raw. So that makes the most sense in my opinion with the draft taking place pretty soon. The brand split going into effect next month. And his final question here. Do you think enhancement talent will be used on WWE Raw and SmackDown after the draft occurs, and should they be? 
I mean, when you say enhancement talent, we're talking Zack Ryder and like Keith Slater here or like local athletes. Either way, yes, just because when they split the roster in half, they need as much talent as they possibly can get to this point, especially with Rob being three hours. So you will definitely see more of Bo Dallas, Heath Slater, Zack Ryder. Will they be pushed? Very unlikely. Um, but we will definitely probably see more of them you know, after the draft takes place just because they're going to be splitting the roster in half and they can barely fill three hours of Raw as it is right now. So I would not be surprised to see more of the social outcasts and guys like Zack Ryder and Fondango and Tyler Breeze post-draft. Uh, moving forward to the Twitter questions here at Brad Berdar. Who would you like to see? Who, who would you like to interview out of John Cena, CM Punk, Randy Orton, Jeff Hardy, and Chris Jericho? Uh, fun fact for you: I actually did interview Chris Jericho last March in March of 2015. The interview is right here on the channel. If you go to interviews under playlists, the whole interview in full from it's a full 10 minute interview is available to listen to, and that was amazing. Probably the biggest interview I ever did. Um, he was really, really great to talk to. An amazing opportunity. I'm still appreciative of that to this day. Um, so kind of got to get Jericho out of there just because they've already talked to him before, believe it or not. But out of Cena, Punk, Orton, Hardy, got to be CM Punk. I mean, this is definitely being biased here, but I love CM Punk so much. One of my favorite, was my favorite wrestler up until his departure, other than, you know, William Regal, of course. Punk was right out there with Christian and uh, with with Christian and Regal and Punk were all my top three. So it would have to be CM Punk. John Cena would be cool just to say to casual people, like when I talk to people about what I do for wrestling, um, and obviously they don't know many people. They, they wouldn't know a, a CM Punk, maybe not, or a Jeff Hardy even, probably if they watched many years ago. But obviously the first thing that comes to mind is John Cena. So to say I interviewed John Cena would be a big feather in my cap, but I love CM Punk. I feel like there's so many more questions I could ask him that he'd be completely honest about, whereas John Cena, I feel like he would get a lot of corporate answers. Randy Orton would be cool too, just because he doesn't get to interview. He doesn't get interviewed a lot. Like he was on Unfiltered with Renee Young. He was on Sam Roberts' show a few years ago, and he was great in both settings. I would love to see a Stunk Old podcast with Randy Orton. That would be really, really cool. Um, and Jeff Hardy would be cool too, but I'd have to go see him punk just because he's always been a favorite of mine. And to interview him and ask him all the questions that I have long wanted to know would be absolutely amazing. Next question of his, it may be too early to judge, but has WWE missed a huge opportunity in not turning Bray Wyatt face? Yes. And they might still be faced. They might be faces in this feud of New Day. I don't think they will be. But, and it's cool to see a fresh feud. It could be a good feud between New Day and Wyatt family. But I really think that they really missed the boat in not bringing Bray Wyatt back as a singles baby face. And you can have him with the Wyatt family. But I feel like they're really, and they already have enough tag teams. They already have enough tag teams. You could put... You know, the New Day with the, the club or Enzo and Cass or the Vaude Villains again, any other team, the Usos, whoever, then the fucking, you know, Wyatt family. It's a fresh feud. I appreciate that. But Bray Wyatt coming off his short-lived hot babyface run that lasted all of a week or two right after WrestleMania, they should capitalize off that, especially given the fact that he was welcomed back with open arms this past weekend Raw. People went nuts for the guy when he came out. So they're really dropping the ball by not making him a big babyface. And maybe he will be in time for SummerSlam. Who knows? But for right now, um, I feel like he should be a babyface. He, he still might be. I have no idea. We've only seen him back for one week. But I do think the money lies with Bray Wyatt as a singles top star level babyface in WWE right now. His next question. What have you made of Darren Young's vignettes? And are you excited to see what Bob Backlund can bring to the table? I'm looking forward to them. They've been dragging on forever now. They've been doing these vignettes for like a month, month and a half. I'm waiting for them to cut to the chase, do something different. But I like the idea. Darren Young has never really been given a chance. I mean, the whole make Darren Young great again, he was never really great to begin with. But I appreciate the, I appreciate the, him giving a chance, the WWE giving him a chance to really get over, to succeed. I mean, other than the Nexus and the primetime players were attacked, he's never really been given a shot, been given a shot as a single star. So that's pretty cool. I'm more excited for Bob Backlund than anything else. I really like Darren Young, but Bob Backlund is so underutilized in WWE. It blows my mind ever since he re-signed with them under the Legends deal back in 2013 when he came in, or even four years ago when he came in for that one-off on Raw 1000. And right before that, to face, to face Heath Slater on Raw. Or it wasn't a real match, but you know what I mean. You locked him in the chicken wing and that was it. Ever since he came back three or four years ago, it's always boggled my mind that they're not doing more with this guy. It's cool to see him with Darren Young, but now we got to get him on TV. Bob Backlund is so great as a character, He's wacky, he's unpredictable, he's fucking nuts, and he's a really nice guy on top of it all. 
So I'm excited to see what he can bring to the table, but it just blows my mind that before now they were doing nothing with this guy in a regular on-air role. Because he really can be a great ambassador for the company, which he has been, but he could be an even better on-air character with what he can bring to the table from what we've seen in recent years and just in, in his overall career from when he was brought back. You know, even in 94, 95 as the heel Mr. President Bob Backlund, he was fucking great. So hopefully they um, bring him to TV sooner rather than later alongside Darren Young. Next question of his, who had more potential to be a star in WWE, Evan Bourne or Justin Gabriel? Great question, just because I feel like they're kind of under the same category in terms of what could have been. They're very, they're both attractive. They have that, you know, that male, that that female look about them, and that oh look, they're they're so handsome, whatever. Like I'm gonna cheer for them because they're hot. Like especially Justin Gabriel, he was very much over with the women because he had that pretty boy look. Um, but along the same lines, they were both very very good in the ring. Both Evan Bourne and Justin Gabriel had the 450 splash. Or no, one at 450. You know, 450 belonged to Justin. Shooting star press to Evan Bourne. Um, who could have been the bigger star? Uh, who had more potential to be a bigger star? I feel like Justin Gabriel. I feel like Justin Gabriel just because, for one thing, I mean, Evan Bourne's been doing really well in Ring of Honor too recently. Gabriel's been doing really well as PJ Black in, in Lucha Underground. Um, but PJ Black, Evan, or uh, Justin Gabriel rather, I feel like he could have been the bigger star. I mean, Evan Bourne, they they pushed for a time in 2010 when, you know, leading up to Money in the Bank, he beat Chris Jericho at the Fatal 4-Way pay-per-view. He had a great showing at Money in the Bank. For Justin Gabriel, anyway, they had a real shot. I mean, G Bourne had his shot as well, but I feel like Gabriel, long-term speaking here, I feel like he could have been the bigger star just because of what they had going with the Nexus. Remember in the Nexus, like he, when he was doing the 450 to John Cena... The Undertaker, Vince McMahon, like he would hesitate before hitting the move. So they really had something there. I mean, I know when Daniel Bryan got hurt, or not got hurt, when he got fired, and they brought him back and whatever else, not a part of the Nexus, but against them. I still felt like the, the dissolution of the Nexus was so poorly flawed. Obviously, they lost a lot of them moment, their momentum when they lost to John Cena at fucking SummerSlam 2010. But beyond that, it would have been cool to see Justin Gabriel be the breakout babyface of the group. Now, his mic skills were not great. I will give you that. His mic skills weren't and still aren't that great but that being said he was awesome in the ring and people wanted to get behind him as the breakout babyface of the group he could have been a very resilient character and like he, he doesn't want to do the 450 like he looked like he was hesitating before hitting the move like he didn't really want to do it. he didn't want to go through with it but he ultimately would anyway um, like his moveset screamed babyface and then beyond the nexus they did nothing with the guy he was in the core for a cup of coffee and no one gave a shit about him then and then beyond that he was gone and he's on Superstars main event and shit for many years. But other than that, they really dropped a big opportunity to uh, push the guy as a singles baby face. So, excuse me. Anyway, uh, I feel like Justin Gabriel could have been a lot bigger of a star than Evan Bourne just because they had the opportunity there with the new Nexus. Evan Bourne could have been a bigger star too. But with Gabriel, they really had a chance there with the Nexus, and they fucked it up. They missed the boat. His final, or two questions here from, uh, from at Brad Berdar. Thoughts on Ty Dillinger being booked. I don't know how he was booked this past week on NXT. I mean, he lost to One Larkin, I think his name was, the former Christopher Gerrard, the former uh, Biff Busick from the independent scene here in the Northeast, who was really, really good. So I was fine with Dillinger losing. And it made more sense to me just because Manny, when he beat him twice, beat Dillinger twice, he's a babyface. But people love Dillinger so much, he's like a babyface. Despite being booked as a heel sometimes, he, to me, is the ultimate like the underdog cult favorite in Full Sail University in NXT. So you should not put Dillinger up against fellow baby faces because they're going to boo that other baby face. But with um with uh, One Larkin, I believe he was supposed to be a heel. So him beating a cult favorite in Ty Dillinger made a lot more sense than Manny beating Ty Dillinger. So I thought it was fun. I, I had no real problem with Dillinger losing because that's his role in NXT to be an enhancement talent, put people over, and One Larkin has a lot more potential. I mean, at this point, I feel like One Lark, I mean, Dillinger can be a big star too, don't get me wrong, but with One Larkin, I saw him wrestle at the NXT Lowell event a couple months ago, and the guy is great in the ring. Christopher Gerard, Biff Busick, One Larkin, whatever the hell you want to call him, uh, he's a really, really good wrestler. So I'm looking forward to seeing where he goes from here. But Dillinger, like I said last week or the week before, I think it was last week with Jason, um, that we both agree that he needs to be a bigger star than what he is right now because they're doing nothing with the guy, and he's just so popular, it's really a waste of his talent, in my opinion. And his final question here 
Seeing it how in terms of quality, it's been a really consistent pay-per-view. Do you think Money in the Bank was a letdown this year? Absolutely not. How could it have been a letdown? I mean, I know the undercard was not the most thrilling of all time. I didn't even think it was that bad. Because I think the undercard, I did not have a problem with any of the finishes whatsoever. In terms of who went over. I mean, I feel like some people could have win, could have won in a more decisive fashion than they did, whatever. But with, um, with who went over, I had no issue with it whatsoever. I feel like all the right people won. And then with the three main events... All of which delivered. So how can you really call the pay-per-view a letdown? If anything, like we talked about last week with Jason, I felt like it was the second greatest installment in Money in the Bank history. Right up there with the 2012 show. Um, way better than last year's show. Way better than the 2014 show, which I felt like was the worst installment of all time. Even not that bad, but in comparison to all the other installments. Uh, the 2016 Money in the Bank show I thought was awesome. So I feel like it really was consistent with the entertainment value of past installments, if not better. Because those three ma- those three main events were great. Reigns and Rollins, the two title changes, Styles and Cena, one of the best matches in WWE after this point, and the awesome Money in the Bank ladder match. So with those three marquee main events, there really, in my mind, is no excuse in calling it a, uh, a poor show. That, to me, was an awesome show, in my opinion, the best pay-per-view of 2016 in WWE to date, thus far anyway. Um, at Sean Markistic, he's got a couple questions here. Push repackage release, and I believe at Big Bird 432 asked the same question, so I don't know if they, if he saw that question and copied it or whatever, probably not, they probably just said the same question and great minds think alike, but anyway, uh, his question was, push repackage release, American Alpha, New Day, and Enzo and Cass, this is freaking tough, because I love all three of these tag teams, and I feel like all three of these teams could be, are, either are or can be big money players for WWE in the future. So, I feel like there's no real right answer here. They're, they're all wrong answers because it's really all interchangeable. But here's my rationale. I would push American Alpha because I feel like these guys will be the future of WWE beyond you know, their tag team days. Repackage Enzo, and Ka- repackage Enzo and Cass into what? I have no idea. But I would release New Day. I know how over they are right now. I know they make a lot of company for the money or make a lot of money for the company, not the other way around. A lot of company for the money. Uh, for WWE at the moment, but I feel like once they break up, like let's say, let's talk about Enzo and Cass, and then American Alpha. Enzo and Cass are just getting over. They have yet to really fit, you know, hit their peak. New Day kind of already has. There's a lot left in the tank with New Day, but Enzo and Cass have a bigger upside just because they have yet to really do much of no on the main roster. They just got here. They have a much longer shelf life at this point than the New Day does. But with New Day anyway... Once they break up, I mean, they could make a big start of any one of those guys, but I feel like Chad Gable and Jason Jordan, in my opinion, are a lot more likely to be pushed as single stars atop the roster than the New Day will be. I mean, I hate to say it, but I really hope Kofi, Biggie, and Xavier Woods aren't relegated back to where they were before the New Day started. They should be bigger stars than what they are, you know, as singles guys beyond the New Day, which they shouldn't break up anytime soon, but WWE might break them up, who knows. This is WWE we're talking about here. Um, but I would release New Day. I know they make a lot more money for WWE than a lot more a lot of the other guys in the current roster, but I'm thinking like long term here. I would release those guys just because Kofi's done it all. Biggie's had a great career. Xavier Woods has done really well for himself, and they still can be very much you know very valuable assets to WWE even this day and age. But I feel like Gable and Jordan have higher potential in terms of fulfilling main event status than Kofi New Day or Kofi Xavier and Biggie do right now. And then Enzo and Cass, like I said, they're just getting started. So I would just repackage them to be more maybe serious in the ring. And then push American Alpha. And as much as I hate to say it, release New Day. His second question, what got you into watching wrestling? I mean, I've talked about this before many times, many, many times. I've talked about it here in the video, or on the random video blog, here on Hashtag. I'll keep a long story short that I started watching in April of 2008. Saw a commercial for Raw with William Regal and Randy Orton facing off in England. And that's what got me hooked, the William Regal character. Uh, just the whole face versus, you know, good versus evil dynamic, the in-ring action, everything about it. But William Regal is one that I credit the most with getting me into wrestling. Because I did try wrestling before that I had watched a few episodes in like late 07, but nothing really got me hooked the way that William Regal did. So it wasn't even like there was great wrestling that got me hooked. It was the William Regal character that got me, that really made me a wrestling fan. Otherwise, I would have been a casual fan at best. But William Regal in his character evolution as Raw GM, King of the Ring, later IC Champion was what really got me into and kept me in wrestling. 
His third question, push repackage release again. Another really tough one. Austin Aries, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Bobby Roode. This is tough. I'd obviously, this is undoubtedly that I'd have to push Nakamura. Roode and Aries are kind of interchangeable. I would repackage Roode into what? Again, I have no idea, but I would release Aries. Just because of Roode and Aries, I feel like Roode is a bigger upside in the main roster than Aries does. They're both amazing talents, but I feel like Bobby Roode has the look, has the skills that WWE is looking for, as does Austin Aries, obviously. But I feel like Bobby Roode just, to me, screams money fucking heel. Like, this guy should be a top star tomorrow. Austin Aries can be, but I feel like because of how short he is, how small he is, they're not going to want to push him towards that level. Whereas I feel there's a bigger chance Bobby Roode could be a world champion in WWE as opposed to Austin Aries. So I would repackage Roode, or I would repackage Roode release Aries, and push Nakamura. At Hardy DX fan. Who do you think Samoa Joe can have a five-star match with? With, with who? Uh, once he comes to the main roster. Whew, there's a lot of guys. I feel like he could have really good matches with Randy Orton. John Cena, undoubtedly. Those guys have a lot of history from the independent scene. I believe they went to the same, went to the same training school. Like, to the same developmental territory or whatever. And they have a lot of history. John Cena, I believe, likes Samoa Joe behind the scenes. So those guys could have great chemistry with each other. Cena and Samoa Joe... Uh, Samoa Joe and Orton, like I said, Samoa Joe and Jericho, Joe and Aries, I mean Joe, or Joe and Aries, yeah, Joe and Styles could have great matches, they had great matches in, in TNA for many years, uh, Brock Lesnar, I feel like Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar could have some really fucking kick-ass matches, Kevin Owens too, but Brock Lesnar, Joe and Lesnar, in my opinion, is like a dream match, and those guys could have a really, really good match if they made Joe to be a threat to Brock Lesnar, so again, Lesnar, Aries, Styles, Owens, Orton, Cena, uh, Jericho, all those guys, I believe, could have five-star, if not awesome matches, really, really phenomenal matches with Samoa Joe once he gets to the main roster, which should hopefully hopefully be only inevitable. Uh, next question from at Mario Bros. Fan94. Da, 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 da. His question was, with Finn Balor most likely having his last match against Shinsuke Nakamura on July 13th in NXT, do you think Finn Balor will get called up to the main roster during the WWE draft? Yes. I feel like it's no coincidence that his last match, you know, presumably with Nakamura is on the 13th, only six days before the draft. I feel like that was done on purpose. So, yes, I do think he will be. I mean, at this point, it's only inevitable before he ends up in the main roster, a lot like Samoa Joe. And there really is no better timing than right during the draft, you know, right after that match and then right in time for the draft. So, I do think that there's a very good chance we could see Balor up on Raw or SmackDown in time for the draft on July 19th, just three or four weeks away. Next question. Also, then, XD most likely getting rated for the draft. Who would you like to see get called up to the main roster, and who do you see getting called up based on this past week's NXT TV tapings? So I didn't watch the tapings. I mean, by that I mean I didn't read the spoilers. I hate spoilers. I don't want to find out about the spoilers. Um, but just going off what I've seen from what I've heard, I could see absolutely Bailey getting called up. I would wait until after SummerSlam, but I could see get her getting called up before that. <clears throat> so Bailey, um, I've heard Nia Jax maybe. I feel like it's too soon for Nia Jax. Carmella and Nia Jax, or Carmella and Alexa Bliss too. Maybe Alexa Bliss, that'd be a possibility. I'd have no issue with that. Uh, if Dana Brooke could get called up, Alexa Bliss absolutely, absolutely can be too. Dana Brooke was not ready for the main roster, but it made sense with the story they were trying to tell with Emma. So I'm going to sit, you know, Indian style here, a lot like CM Punk did five years ago today, so I won't drop a pipe bomb on you, but anyway, uh, Alexa Bliss, Bailey, Nakamura's a possibility, Austin Aries, Joe, I feel like it's only a matter of time, American, Al uh, American Alpha, absolutely, Mojo Raleigh, as weird as that sounds, I could see him getting promoted just to be with Zack Ryder in one of the shows as a tag team, as the Hype Bros, so uh, yeah, I could see all those guys, if not most of them being called up in time for the draft in a few more weeks. Uh, next question. Talking about Carmella, from at Cody Collier, 37, do you think Carmella could get called up to the main roster during the WWE draft? Could she? Yes. Would I want to see it happen? No. Just because I feel like the whole reason why she wasn't called up with Enzo and Cass many months ago was because Triple H saw something. I mean, obviously that was before the draft came about. The whole, it was, you know, the news broke about the draft. But the whole reason why she was kept behind was because Triple H saw something in her as a single star, as a future player in NXT's women's division. And she's not quite there yet. So I would not call her up just yet, but it would not surprise me to see her on one of the shows with Enzo and Cass, just, to get, just so they could have another woman on the roster to add to their two separate women's rosters on Raw and SmackDown, because I believe they're setting up, you know, you know, separating the two shows. 
with women on Raw and SmackDown. So they're, gonna need, they're, they're definitely going to need more women on both shows because there's a lot of women out injured right now too. Naomi, Tamina, Sasha Banks, Nikki Bella, Brie Bella's gone. So uh, yeah, they're going to need all the talent they can get. And I could see Carmella getting called up. But would I want to see it so seen? No, just because I feel like there's more for her to accomplish in NXT going forward. In uh, his second question, I already answered the whole repackage release push for with uh, New Day and Zone Cast American Alpha. At Reborn Again, if WWE keeps Roman Reigns in the main event scene after his suspension, could you see talents asking for their release? I feel like that's a bit far-fetched. I mean, I could see talent being pissed that the guy is in the title match at the next pay-per-view. But we know Roman Reigns, regardless of suspension or not, is going to be a main event player for a while to come. Suspension or not. He may not win the championship right away, nor should he. But I have no doubt in my mind that he'll continue to be booked and uh, kept in the main event scene for, you know, going forward once he comes back from suspension. He will not be demoted to the mid card. He's still going to be a main event player, as he should be. He fucked up, but he, that should not, he should still be a main event guy. He should not be champion again anytime soon, but he will be and should be a main event guy upon his return. So for people to quit over that, I feel like would be so stupid. I could see the double standards with him winning the championship in his first match back from a fucking suspension, but keeping him in the main event scene and people quitting because of that, I feel like would be just super foolish. And his second question here, who would you put as the GM for Raw and SmackDown for the brand split, i.e. bring back Teddy uh, or Bischoff or whoever? Uh, so with that being said, who would I have as the Raw or SmackDown GMs? Solomonster, Jason Solomon, talked with us on his podcast, Solomonster Sounds Off this past weekend. Kurt Angle is a SmackDown GM, and I fucking love that idea. I would definitely do that. For Raw GM, I would book Mike Adamley. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Eric Bischoff would be cool. I don't see it happening. For Raw, I could see Shane or Stephanie. I don't really want to see that. Shane would be cool, but I'd rather see a fresh face, like a, a big name being brought back. Sting, I know Solomonster mentioned. That'd be pretty cool. Hogan being brought back would be nice. Um, he should be brought back anyway. I mean, it's been almost a year since the scandal. So, I mean, he could be brought back pretty soon. Who knows? Hogan, Sting, Angle, any one of those guys. Daniel Bryan would be awesome. I don't see it happening just because he's currently a commentator for the Gooseway Classic. Um, but I could see that being a, I, I could see that being a possibility post draft. So I don't really have one name in mind, but Angle, Sting, Hogan, Brian, you know, Sheen, not Stephanie, but just Shane. Any one of those people running Raw or SmackDown would be awesome in my opinion. Um, it would be a lot better than just doing Shane and Stephanie Raw and SmackDown. I feel like that's so predictable. They need a big name in order for it to not disappoint. Up next, we got at Zach Donigan. First question being thoughts on WWE offering Cody Rhodes a legend deal. They just got to leave this guy alone. I mean, I read that and I just laughed. It's like, okay, you let the guy go. I mean, technically he asked for his release, but they were doing jack shit with him for the past two or three years. And then you go and annoy him once he finally feels like a hotter commodity than he's probably been in at least five years. Honestly, he feels more relevant now in wrestling than he ever was as Stardust in the final few years of his WWE tenure. In taking bookings on the indie scene, doing a UK tour I saw. I think he's getting into Hollywood pretty soon. To me, I read that, and I saw your question uh, when I read that last night. And the first thing that came to mind for me, it's almost like when you break up with somebody or something along those lines. And it's the other person that initiates the, or it's you that initiates the breakup because they're really not doing their part. And it's not your fault, but you're the one that initiates the breakup and say, okay, let's go our separate ways. But it's that other person that says, okay, that's completely fine. I want to go our separate ways too. So you guys break up, but then your significant other, whether it be your boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever, they're saying, okay, so I know that we're not technically together, but can I still, you know, can we still hang out or can we still this do this stuff or still be do whatever? Uh, still, do the, still do the same stuff or still can I use, I don't know what the exact comparison would be in this case, but still, let's say let's be friends, okay? Let's still be friends in this respect, but not still technically be together. And it's like, no, I don't want to do that. If you're not going to be with me, then why would I still want to do that stuff? You know what I mean? It feels like that's what the case is here with WWE and Cody Rhodes. They don't want to bring him back. It's almost like, okay, hey, <laughs> this is almost an exact comparison here. It's like that person's looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend, but they're asking you like, hey, we could still be friends, but can we still can we still do boyfriend-girlfriend stuff, but not technically be together, even though I'm looking for a boyfriend-girlfriend right now? You know what I mean? To me, that makes no sense because WWE is asking all these old-timers to come back. It's like your old ex is looking for a new boyfriend-girlfriend, and they're looking for old exes, 
before they're going back to you. You know what I mean? Like, this is a prime time to bring back Cody Rhodes, the brand split going into effect. And they could use him, but they don't really want him. But they want to use his likeness. You know what I mean? And to me, it just feels so fucked up. It's like, leave the guy alone. He's finally doing a lot better now than he ever was when he was with them in his final few years with the company. And that might be a horrid comparison. It might be a great comparison. I don't know. You be the judge. Um, but I have no idea. I just thought, I, I saw that and I laughed just because it seems so stupid to me. Why would they want him under a Legends deal anyway? I mean, they never really sold any merch for him. I mean, Dusty Rhodes, I could see, but they already have Goldust in their contract. So any Dusty Rhodes stuff, like for the Tag Team Classic, they could still do that shit. They don't need Cody Rhodes. So what, are they going to sell merchandise under the Cody Rhodes name? Then why wouldn't you turn it back into fucking Cody Rhodes in the first place? It makes no goddamn sense. Okay, so we're going to release Cody Rhodes merchandise, but when you were with us, we didn't want you to become Cody Rhodes. We wanted to keep you as Stardust. Why? Because fuck you. That's why. That's the reasoning for pretty much everything. So I think it's so fucking dumb. And like I said, just leave the guy alone. Just leave him alone. Don't bug him to come back to you for not the reasons that even that he wants. See, I don't even know if he would come back if they offered him a new job to come back as a part of the brand because he probably knows they would do nothing with him again. <sighs> so that's my comparison for the Cody Rhodes WWE situation. Again, it might be awful. It might be brilliant. You let me know. You be the judge. Do you think we ever get new theme songs slash sets for Raw slash SmackDown once the brand split happens? If so, any themes do you have in mind? Um, do I think it'll happen? No, but would it be cool? Should it happen? Absolutely. I feel like new sets, new theme songs will set the precedent that yes, this really is the new era in WWE. We've had the Raw theme song, which isn't bad. Uh, Tonight is the night. It's a lot better than you know, Burn It to the Ground, which I liked, but it's a lot better than Nickelback. And it's produced by WWE's go-to company, CFO Money. Uh, we've had that song since 2012. The SmackDown song we've only had for a few years. Uh, Black and Blue we've only had since like 2014, 2015. So I'm fine if they keep it. The new sets to me is what is really more important. You cannot have the same aesthetically looking sets. And I've said this time and time and time again. If Raw and SmackDown look alike, they're going to feel alike. And if you want two separate shows, especially now with the brand split coming back, you need the shows to be as different and feel as different as possible. I'm not saying you need to bring back the big fist, but you need to make that set as different as possible from Raw. We've had the same sets for the past eight fucking years since they went HD. It looks amazing on TV, but it feels stagnant. We've had the same sets for years, and the pay-per-view shit is just, you know, it, it's just lazy. And I've talked to that time and time before. I know that's not what your question is. But anyway, if they change their theme songs, I'm not going to say, oh, bring back Across the Nation. Like, that feels like 2 You can't go backwards in order to go forwards. But um, in terms of new songs, I don't know. Anything, I don't really know what songs they could use. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. I know they would just use songs. If they're going to come up with a new theme song for Raw or SmackDown, it would just be a song by CFO Money. Pretty much every show song they've done is by CFO Money. Raw's theme song... Smackdowns, Main Event, Superstars, All by CFO Money, Total Divas, uh, fucking Tough Enough Was, I think, and that was by Kevin Rudolph, but you know what I mean, a lot of their songs that they do nowadays are in-house, and by that I mean they're produced by either Jim Johnson or CFO Money. I always love the song Smackdown by Thousand Foot Crutch. Um, it's a few years old by this point, so I don't know, like, it's, if they're going to use a song, a new song for Raw or Smackdown, it'd be a song that's out right now to promote the album. The Thousand Foot Crutch song has been out for years now, but it's entitled SmackDown. It's a really good song, and I feel like it'd be a perfect fit for the Blue brand. I know that's not happening, but I've always thought that'd be a great theme for SmackDown. That's just my opinion. And his next question here, any mid-carders, people that haven't won a major title, that you would want to see come back after the brand split? Like I said earlier, Kennedy, Carlito, Benjamin, especially Morrison, any one of those guys I would love to see back in WWE. Scott Steiner is a guilty pleasure. He would serve no purpose in the in a brand split new era, but I think it'd just be funny as fuck to see him back, if not for a one you know a one off only appearance. At Swagzio, their question was push repackage release Apollo Cruz, Baron Corbin, and Tyler Breeze. Uh, this is hard. I mean, I would push Cruz because I feel like out of those three, he has the most potential to be a top star in WWE. We package Breeze to make him more serious. I like the gimmick, but in the main roster, they're doing nothing with him, so I would repackage him and release Corbin. I love Baron Corbin, but I feel like of the two between him and Cruz, and especially Breeze, he has the less, the least amount of potential to be a big star in WWE, whereas Apollo Cruz, I could see him as a world champion. Breeze, he just needs the right push, and he's a lot better of an athlete. He's a lot better of a wrestler than Baron Corbin. 
So I would push Cruz, repackage Breeze, and release Corbin. At E13A, did you hear Michael Cole yell pedigree when Dean Ambrose used dirty deeds at the end of last week's Raw? I did not catch that. I heard someone make a mention about it on like a live chat or something, and that makes a lot more sense now that you said that to me. I probably wasn't paying attention. That's just funny as fuck, though. Um, his next question, keep or erase the Raw pay-per-views from 03 to 06 or the SmackDown pay-per-views from that same time period? Oh, that's a great question. You know, this might be a bit of a surprise because I know SmackDown was like always superior to Raw in terms of quality, but I would go the Raw pay-per-views just because I love the Raw shows from 05 and whatnot. I feel like the SmackDown pay-per-views, as great as they were in like 03, maybe 04, and Triple H dominated most of that time period, but I feel like the pay-per-views on the on the whole were a lot better than the SmackDown shows. The SmackDown shows, I feel like they were really depleted of star power, so the undercard of the shows were really bland, like Matt Hardy versus Gregory Helms. Who gives a fuck? Like, at least the undercard matches on the Raw shows were halfway decent, so... I'd have to watch most of them back. I've reviewed a lot of them from 03 to 06, both Raw and SmackDown pay-per-views. But, um, I don't know. I think I've enjoyed the Raw pay-per-views more, even though SmackDown was the superior show, by and large, in terms of quality. But I'll just say Raw for right now because they have fonder memories of those pay-per-views from that time period than I do SmackDown. At Breaking Bear 216, would Rollins, Ambrose, Styles, KO, or any other internet favorites get the same backlash that Reigns did if they got suspended? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, yes, I feel like people wouldn't be making as many jokes. People already disliked Roman Reigns to begin with. This just gives them another reason to dislike Roman Reigns. So, no, I feel like there would be double standards. I mean, I just laughed when I saw Roman Reigns got suspended just because they never really expected something like that would happen. Um, and people made a lot of jokes about it. So, would the backlash be there of people getting pissed? It depends. I mean, if it was, I would probably say the same thing. If, let's say AJ Styles had a shot at the WWE title at the next pay-per-view, and he'd be back in time in order to compete for the match, even though I love Styles, I mean, I can't say unless it happened. But I feel like I would say the same thing about him, that there's, I, although I would love to see Styles get another shot of the belt, you can't have him get suspended and then come back and be in a title match at the pay-per-view. That just screams to me double standards. You can't fucking do that. So, Roman Reigns, AJ Styles, Zack Ryder, it doesn't matter. To me, it's double standards to have Roman Reigns get suspended for something that he fucked up for, not got injured, he fucked up and got suspended. And then in his first match back, you put him in a match that he won't even be around to build for the next fucking month. That, to me, makes absolutely no sense. So, even if it was KO or Ambrose or Rollins, I would say the same thing about those guys. I would love to see the Shield triple threat. We're probably still going to see it unless something else changes tonight on Raw. They need to acknowledge the fact that he got suspended. They probably won't. They should, but they won't. But um, I feel like in my in my defense anyway, I don't know about any of the rest of the internet. The internet is so unpredictable. I have no idea. But um, I, feel, I, I personally would say the same thing about any one of those guys if they were in that same situation. If they got suspended and they were going to be in the main event of a pay-per-view for the World Championship in their first match back from suspension, I would say the same thing, because that to me makes no fucking sense, and it's not fair to the rest of the roster. His next question, why are you so low in WrestleMania 14? Most fans love this WrestleMania, and even some older fans like it better than 17, 3, 19, and 30. Just to me, for one, I don't like the year of 1998. It's just not my cup of tea. Let's, you know what? Let's look at it right now. I know I've watched WrestleMania 14 before. I've reviewed it here for the channel on WrestleRant. But I'm going to run down the card right now. The only thing I remember liking about that WrestleMania was the main event. Was Austin and Michaels. And even that match wasn't that great. Because they had a much better match at King of the Ring the year prior. And that match was a lot better than this one. I mean, obviously people remember the, you know Austin getting his big moment, winning his first world championship. That's all great and whatever. Let's look at the card here. LOD 2000 winning a battle royal. Was, yeah, it was a, pack, a tag team battle royal. No one gave, uh, gave a crap about this. LOD 2000. Well, I mean, they loved LOD 2000 coming back, but their run was a bust. Takamichi Naka versus Agia. The light heavyweight division was a bust. Triple H and Owen Hart had a good match. Hardly memorable, but still a good match. Mark Mero and Sable versus Goldust and Luna was what you would expect it to be. Not a WrestleMania marquee match, but was what it was. The Rock versus Ken Shamrock had a shitty finish. A five-minute match, so not a good match. Um, the dumpster tag team match was fun, not amazing, but it was fun for what it was. Taker and Kane was a pretty good match in the main event I already talked about. So, again, I just didn't enjoy this WrestleMania. Not a, that's not to say it's a bad WrestleMania. My opinion and facts are two very different things. 
and even to call it a great WrestleMania is just that pure opinion. That said, though, I just, I don't know, I just did not like that WrestleMania because the moments and matches weren't that great. The moments were better than the matches, and there's other better WrestleManias from later on. 19, I thought, was a lot better. Um, 18, I thought, was pretty good. 17, I thought, was amazing. Just this WrestleMania, to me, just kind of fell in between the other lackluster WrestleManias. 13, I thought, sucked, too. 15, I thought was a piece of shit. I mean, the Attitude Era was great. Don't get me wrong, but the WrestleManias from those time periods, from that time period, were not great, in my opinion. I don't know why, but again, you say other people love three, love this WrestleMania more than three, 17, 19, and 30. I don't know about liking that more than 17, but they were there for that WrestleMania. Of course, they're going to like it more than I would. I was not there for WrestleMania, but I've talked to people that were fans during that time period and didn't like that WrestleMania either. Just because on paper and just the way it delivered, it was not a great mania. It was a great time to be a fan, but it was not that great of a WrestleMania. Just my opinion. Um, his next question, I love Sasha too, but do the other women, especially Becky, deserve to be continually get crapped on on her behalf? I mean, Sasha deserves the push she's getting right now, but like you said, it should not come at Becky's expense. I'm not saying they should take away from Sasha's push to give to Becky's too. Um, they should continue to push Sasha at the rate that, that they are, but Becky should be spotlighted. At least she's getting TV time. People still really much like Becky, so it's okay that she's not like not on TV like Sasha was. But in Sasha's defense, they had a reason for keeping her off TV, so it would mean more when she got brought back. And look at that at work. They popped huge when she showed up on Raw last week. So Becky does deserve to be pushed more, spotlighted more, featured more. So she's not being buried. She's losing, but... And she's, she deserves more wins, but that's her character. She's a plucky underdog babyface. She's not going to be winning every match she's in anyway. She's not getting buried. That, I don't want to even hear that excuse. Uh, but Becky deserves more spotlight in the women's division. His next question, best of the B-level women in NXT, Peyton Royce, Billy Kay, Liv Morgan, Deanna Perrazzo, etc. Who needs a bigger push? Of the women you mentioned, I would say Deanna... I like Deanna Perrazzo, but I think out of all those women, probably... Peyton Royce, because I feel like she's the only one of those women who has a real character as the Poison Ivy-like thing. She's got legs that go on for days. She looks gorgeous. They're all gorgeous. But Peyton Royce has gotten a lot better. I feel like she's, she deserves the bigger push out of all those women. Billy Kay's gorgeous, too. She just doesn't really have much of a character from what I've seen. Liv Morgan like is like Enzo and Cass, the female version of Enzo and Cass. I know it's kind of Carmella, but the whole New Jersey thing. She's not that great in the ring. She's good. Deanna Perrazzo, I think, is just cute as hell, but she's not, I mean, she's pretty good, but they, we really don't have a, have a reason to care about her right now. Uh, Santana Garrett, she's not under contract, but I would love to see her get signed. Um, I think she went by that name in NXT, but, uh, or Brittany, no, that was her TNA name, but she's really, really good. I would love to see Santana Garrett in NXT. I know she's not under contract. And, uh, who was the other one? Uh, not Paul Ellering's daughter or not Santana Garrett. Who was the other girl? Freaking uh, Tessa Blanchard. I would love to see her sign. I would love to see her get the bigger push out of probably all the women you named because I think she's really, really good. I don't think she's under contract yet, but she should be pretty soon, hopefully. And his last question here. What with feuds like Foley and Rock from 1999, Triple H and Rock in 2000, and Angle Benoit Jericho from 2000 to 2001, why is 50-50 booking bad now? That's like comparing night and day, I feel like. 50-50 booking is bad now. Let's compare Baron Corbin and Dolph Ziggler to the feuds that you mentioned. To Foley and Rock. Foley and Rock, when they had their feud, I didn't. I hate when the title changed hands like a hot potato, like a game of hot potato anyway. But it worked because people liked Mick Foley. They were, he was already over, as was The Rock. Baron Corbin was not all that over when he first came up from NXT. Dolph Ziggler, no one gave a shit about to begin with anyway. So when you have the two trading, feud, or trading wins in a feud, no one's going to care. When you have two unestablished guys... It's not going to work. When you have two main event level guys, let's say Cena and Styles trade victories at Money the Bank and at Battleground. I want si I want Styles to win back to back just because that's just, that's the way that Cena works. When he beats somebody, they're pretty much dead in the water from the get go. But when they're all they're already over, and they're not going to suffer. You know what I mean? They're already established. So it's 50-50 booking in that respect is okay. For Corbin and Ziggler, Apollo Cruz, Sheamus, people that are not that over, or people just fans that just don't care about, it doesn't work. But with the guys that you mentioned, I mean, come on. Angle, Benoit, Jericho, Rock, Triple H, Foley, they were already over, if not already had a fan following in WWE. If they weren't established, they were already over. Everyone was over in the fucking Attitude Era. So that's not really a valid comparison because I feel like those people were over, they could afford to do 50-50 booking. Whereas nowadays, 
very few people are actually over. People get good reactions, but are they really over? Probably not. You know what I mean? Like, the New Day are over because they consistently win. They didn't win and lose, win, lose, win, lose attacking titles. They've been champions for a freaking year. And that's why people love them, because they've been consistently winners for over a year. I guarantee you that despite how entertaining they are, if they won the belts, dropped them, one dropped, one dropped the belts in the span of a few months, people would have stopped caring a long time ago. They would not be nearly as over as they are right now. My opinion. If it's the consistent booking... The entertainment factor of the New Day is great, but it's their consistent booking that has made them get over. Charlotte, same thing. At Scarlet One, got a couple questions here. First question being, oh crap, I zoomed up a little bit. Scrolled up on the page. Let me get back to where we were. Uh, how many movies have you seen this year in your favorite and least favorite of them so far? So funny that you mentioned that just because I made a whole list last night because I went to go see Finding Door yesterday. I work in a movie theater, so I get in for free. I get popcorn for free, soda for free, tickets for free. It's fucking awesome. Greatest job in the world. Um, but we saw Finding Door yesterday. When I got home, I made a whole list of every movie that I've seen thus far in 2016. Thus far, I've seen nine movies uh, so far this year. I have seen In Order because I just remember what movies I've seen. I've seen Daddy's Home in January. February, I saw Deadpool and Zoolander 2. March, I saw 10 Cloverfield Lane, which was really, really good. April, Jungle Book. Again, a really, really good movie. A lot better than I thought it was going to be for a real life adaption. Uh, a real live adaption of a book, which is usually not that great of, of a cartoon movie, but it was actually really good. Uh, in May, I saw Captain America 3 and Neighbors 2. June, I've seen The Shallows, Central Intelligence, and uh, Finding Dory. So out of all those movies, it's hard to say which one is my undisputed favorite. Deadpool was a lot better, again, than I thought it was going to be. Really, really funny. My favorite, probably not, but it's up there. Finding Dory might be my favorite, along with either Central Intelligence. I don't know if that was my favorite, but it was also really, really good. Um, Finding Dory and Captain America 3 are probably tied for my favorite movies that I've seen so far this year. Lee's favorite, undoubtedly, Zoolander 2. It sucked. There might have been two points in the movie. And by the way, for me to say something like that is very rare. Because more often than not, even if a movie is not that great, Hot Tub Time Machine 2 being a prime example, not a great movie, but funny as hell, I really enjoyed it. Zoolander 2 was really random. I thought it was going to be a lot funnier than it was because I really liked the first movie. I laughed maybe once or twice at Zoolander 2. It was fun to go to the movies, obviously, but the movie itself sucked. I would not recommend it. That was undoubtedly my least favorite movie of this year. And it was a financial flop, too, so I'm not shocked at that whatsoever. But um, my favorite, it's a tie, I would have to say, with either Captain America Civil War or Finding Dory. Next question of theirs was, Bray Wyatt returning heel instead of babyface, a bad idea. Like I said earlier, time will tell, but I feel like the money is there with him as a babyface. He could be a face still. We don't really know. We really have not heard or seen much of Bray Wyatt in the past week. Only on Raw and SmackDown. We'll find out more tonight, obviously, in the weeks to come. But I feel like the money with Bray Wyatt is with him as a babyface on his own as a singles guy. He could still have the Wyatt family, but I'm talking about not in the tag team division. At least not right now. So I do think it was a mistake. But um, hopefully they write that wrong sooner rather than later. Their next question, did you see that segment on Raw with Jericho complaining to Sheen? I have to admit, Sheen making a threat against them against Jericho and Jericho and seemingly, or rather, making a, uh, a threat against Jericho and Jericho seemingly acting scared was a little too Stephanie McMahon-ish. It's not as bad as the Charlotte Flair segment, but is it wrong to worry about Sheen trying too hard to make himself look cool at the expense of the other wrestlers? A little bit. You make a great point. You make it a really, really good point. I love Sheen, and I didn't really mind the segment. I thought it was actually pretty entertaining, but it kind of was Stephanie McMahon-ish, so I can't do double standards here. I got to admit that, yeah, they really should not try to have the authority figures, both Sheen and Stephanie, not just Stephanie, but Sheen too, not try to cut the balls out from under the wrestlers. You know what I mean? So I know Stephanie does it all the time, and it gets nobody over. The Jericho thing was a little less like that, and it was a little more enjoyable and funny and lighthearted, but it was kind of along the same lines and making a threat to Chris Jericho. So you make a great point. Let's keep an eye out for that going forward because I didn't really notice that. I didn't really pick up on that, but I love Jericho. I love Shane, but I can't really excuse that at all. They need to stop doing it with both people, not just Stephanie. And their final question here, keep, erase, or revise. Barrett's, Sheamus, and Regal's King of the Ring victories. Really good question. I love these Keep revise, revi uh, keep or erase questions. 
which I got to credit uh, Sal to at the Russell guy. His questions are coming up right after at Scarlet Ones. He came up with that many weeks ago. I love this set of questions. That and push repackage release, I also love. Thanks to you guys for keeping those questions going. But anyway, keep a race revised. Barrett, Sheamus, and Regal's King of the Ring victories. This is tough. I know this is going to sound biased, but I would keep Regal's King of the Ring victory. I know the tournament itself wasn't that great. The match he had with Punk in the finals was short-lived. It was good, short-lived. Um, but Regal's King of the Ring victory was intriguing because he was the raw GM at that time, too. And again, that's what made me a wrestling fan. So if he didn't win the King of the Ring, would I be a wrestling fan to this day? Probably not. So I'd have to keep it if I were me. But even disregarding that, the King of the Ring victory was huge because he was raw GM and led to a great month of TV. I know he fucked up and got suspended. But um, before that, he was having a great run as Raw GM and King of the Ring. So I got to keep that one. It was really, really good up until the suspension. I'd have to revise the Barrett one because him winning was very intriguing. And it could have done a lot more with that. And it could have really made him a star after years and years and years of him getting fucked over. But they gave him the plunger. They gave him a, a shitty looking crown. They made him the stereotypical king. And it did not work. They put him in a feud with R-Truth of all people. So, I would revise that to make him a better king and not put him in a feud with our truth, not give him a fucking plunger, because that was awful. So, I would revise that and just erase the Sheamus one. Sheamus winning wasn't awful, but he went on a massive losing streak. And the biggest difference between him and the Barrett victory was that Barrett could have used that King of the Ring victory to really get a step further in his career. By the point that Sheamus won King of the Ring, he was already established. He was already a two time world champion, he was already a two time WWE champion. He really did not need the King of the Ring crown. And he looked stupid as hell wearing the King of Sheamus shit anyway. He went on a losing streak. It was a total waste. So again, I'd keep the Regal King of the Ring victory, revise Barrett's, and erase Sheamus's. Uh, at the Wrestle Guy, Sal, the final three questions here before we close it off on the five-year anniversary of Punk's Pipe Bomb promo. Uh, first question being, should Brock Lesnar be on both shows come the draft or be exclusive to one brand to make that show, to have that, make that show have the upper edge? I believe he will be assigned to one show, because from what I heard, he is being advertised for the draft show on July 19th on that SmackDown. So I think they're bringing him in to get drafted to one show over the other. Um, it'd be cool if he appeared on both shows, because he doesn't really come around all too often anyway. But to make the draft more legitimate, you got to keep him on one show. Um, having people go back and forth, I've talked about it before. I don't want to sound like I'm being hypocritical here. You got to assign people to a show. Going back and forth is just so stupid. It takes away from the whole draft purpose, the concept to begin with. So I would assign him to one show. Maybe he goes to SmackDown. That'd be pretty freaking cool. Keeping him Raw, the A show that gets the higher ratings. I'd be fine with that too. But yeah, I would have to agree. I wouldn't be pissed if he appeared on both shows. But I think it'd be, it, it would make more sense. And I feel like this is the direction they're going in anyway. With him being advertised for the draft. That he will be assigned to one show. Having him go back to SmackDown would be really, really cool. So hopefully we something, see something along those lines when he gets the uh, come the draft in a few weeks. And his second question, with Reigns' suspension, do you think he has to come back as a heel? Or do you think he'd be fine as a babyface? He's got to come back as a heel. Even before the suspension, we were talking about this time and time again. I have no idea why he's not a heel already. He came off like a dick at Money in the Bank and on Raw when he, showed, when he told people to shut up. He told the fans to shut their mouths. AJ Styles did the same exact thing and he turned heel a week later. Why, cannot, why can we not get the same thing with Roman Reigns? You have a ready-made babyface with Seth Rollins. You have Dean Ambrose as the world champion. You also have John Cena waiting in the wings as well. You do not need Roman Reigns as a babyface. And you'll probably, the ratings and live event stuff will show that in the next month. They do not need Roman Reigns. It sucks that he got suspended. It's a big blow to the roster. But with guys like Cena, Ambrose, and Rollins carrying the load right now, they do not need Roman Reigns as a top-tier babyface. So he should be a heel when he gets back. Especially considering that he fucked up and got suspended. A lot of people will probably be chanting, Ro you know, uh, Roman Roids or whatever when he gets back. So you might as well roll off that, capitalize on that momentum, that publicity, so to speak, and turn him heel. And the last question, which I fucking love, thanks to Sal for closing out the video with this question. The last question I got, and it's so perfect. Keep or erase Austin's 316 King of the Ring promo or the CM Punk Pipe Bomb promo, which the five-year anniversary is actually today as he says in his question so keep or raise the austin 316 king of the ring promo or the cm punk pipe bomb promo from five years ago today wow that's a great great question and i know i'm gonna sound like a super cm punk mark for saying this 
I gotta keep the pipe on promo and erase the King of the Ring promo. And here's why. The King of the Ring promo might be better, but it did not have a lasting impact other than selling a lot of t-shirts, Austin 316. But Austin was going to be a bigger star. He was going to be a huge star regardless. Without that pipe bomb promo, and granted CM Punk was already a world champion, a three-time world champion to be exact, but it was that promo that really, for once, set in motion the summer of Punk. In my opinion, like I've talked about before, I talked about it years ago on the on the random video blog. In my opinion, it was that promo that really brought change to the company. It really, really, really changed a lot of things for the better. CM Punk, Daniel Bryan kind of paving the way for guys like Ambrose, Rollins, and Roman Reigns. One night in Las Vegas five years ago today, CM Punk, you know, set a precedent for future indie guys like Daniel Bryan, Seth Rollins, Ambrose, Sami Zayn, Cesaro, Kevin Owens, AJ Styles, the list goes on and on and on. Five years later, one night in Las Vegas, not to the day, but same month, June of 2016, Dean Ambrose ends Money in the Bank as the new WWE Champion. And you got to thank guys like Brian and Punk for paving the way. No matter how much you might hate Punk, which I know there's a lot of you out there and that's completely okay, he and Brian paved the way for people like Ambrose, Rollins, Cesaro, Owen, Styles, Zayn, the list goes on and on and on and on, Balor, for those guys to be successful in WWE. That size does not matter. It's all about the talent. Not always all about the talent, but... Just being an overall great performer. Those guys would not even gotten a look at five or six years ago. Because of Brian and Punk, though, that mold has been broken. That ceiling, that glass ceiling has been shattered because of Punk and Brian. Specifically, Punk with the promo five years ago today. That promo, I've talked about it time and time again. I could not tell you how many people, not even through the internet, not only through Bleach Report on articles, not only through Twitter and Facebook... My own friends have told me that it was that promo that made them a wrestling fan again. My old teacher who I've talked about here on the channel before, that um, he was a wrestling fan, a huge CM Punk fan. He was kind of going in and out. He was floundering in and out of watching wrestling, but the pipe bomb promo got him back into wrestling. And he's been watching avidly. You know, He's been watching religiously ever since. Uh, I was talking to a kid just yesterday, literally at work, a kid that is no longer a wrestling fan, and that was one of his last great memories of watching wrestling was the CM Punk pipe bomb promo. And he said how revolutionary it was. His brother loved it, and he loved it. John is another prime example. He has said this to me himself, that he's always been a wrestling fan. He never really stopped watching. But before the Punk pipe bomb promo, and the pipe bomb promo was what kind of made him a CM Punk fan, which is okay. It's not like he's jumping on the bandwagon. I've been a fan of his since 2010, since the year prior. But he said he did not really care about wrestling. I mean, John and I watched wrestling together, but we didn't really... We've always loved wrestling. But I could tell that before the pipe bomb, John was kind of on the verge of not being a wrestling fan anymore. I don't know if CM Punk really saved his wrestling fandom. You'd have to ask himself at GNAP's Ring Rap on the Twitter. But he has said to me that that pipe bomb promo, the whole summer of Punk, really rejuvenated his love for wrestling. So John, my co-worker my old teacher from high school, and many others as well have always told me it was that pipe on promo that got them back into wrestling, made them love wrestling, reminded them why they're a wrestling fan. The Austin 316 promo, as amazing as it was, did not have that same long-term impact. Two months after cutting that promo, Austin was at SummerSlam on the pre-show against Yokozuna. So it did not really have that same long-term impact. Yes, he became a main event star, Years later, even later on that year in that feud with Bret Hart, but it was not because of that promo. You know, it, it did not have that immediate impact. The only thing that had an immediate impact from Austin's promo were the t-shirts, which was huge. One of, if not the highest selling t-shirt of all time. But overall, like business-wise, it didn't have that much of an impact because Austin was going to be a big star regardless. Without that promo, he still would have been... The biggest star of the Attitude Era, in my opinion. Austin 316 did not need to happen. He still would have been the big star that he was. The Pipe Bomb promo, rather, like I said, had a lasting impact on many people and the company and the Honor product. So, I gotta go with the Pipe Bomb promo. Keep the Pipe Bomb promo. Erase Austin 316. So, again, guys, like I said, he ended the video last week, too, at the Russell Guy Cell. He ended last week's video, the great question, also about, also about Punk, keeping or erasing his... 
Uh, Money in the Bank title win from Money in the Bank 2011 and or, and or erasing his Survivor Series victory from later on that year that kicked off his 434-day reign as champion. For my answer for that question, check out last week's video with Jason. Like I said, uh, really fun talking to Jason, doing that video. Hopefully we can hang out again soon. I should be hanging with John pretty soon. Hopefully we can film another hashtag Ask You Some video in the near future. Sal as well, be on the lookout for that. Um, it's going to be a great blockbuster summer right here on Hashtag Ask You Sam. Thank you as always for joining me for another historic episode of the show and the five-year anniversary of the CM Punk Pipe Bomb promo before Raw tonight, which I'm very much looking forward to. But of course, before next week's premiere installment in the month of July, you guys can send me questions uh, right on Twitter with the hashtag Ask You Sam at WrestleRant on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Graham.Jason.Matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself. Or right here on YouTube, leave a comment on this very video or be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So speaking of which, next week's edition, today fell on the five-year anniversary of the Pipe Bomb promo. Last week's fell on the uh, first day of summer. Next week's falls on the 4th of July, which is pretty cool. So um, I have no idea what time I'm working. If I'm working at all that day, I didn't take the day off. But I have, for the past two years, worked on 4th of July. This year, I imagine, will be no different because it's usually busy at the movie theater on 4th of July. But regardless, whether I'm working in the morning or at night or whatever, I will be, <clears throat> excuse me, I will be filming, as always, hashtag Ask You Sim, a very special holiday episode for you guys uh, next week on the 4th of July. So with that being said, guys, as always, have an amazing week. Enjoy the rest of this amazing stellar summer and what should be one of, if not the biggest summer in WWE or just in general to date. And uh, have an awesome one. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you folks down the road.